So I wanted to thank you for the invitation to come and talk today. Perhaps not many, very many of you know, I am indeed a bone pathologist. I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I work at the Mass General Hospital, which is a fairly busy bone resection center. So we see more than our fair share of bone pathology as well as non-neoplastic pathology. And that's really going to be the focus of this talk today. You'll hear a lot of people telling you that bone is hard. I personally don't think, well, bone is hard, obviously, because that allows us to be upright. But in terms of histology, in terms of pathology, bone is not all that hard. In fact, if bone pathology is relatively simple, particularly if you hold some very cardinal rules in your head. And so we'll talk a little bit about histology, we'll talk a little bit of those cardinal rules in bone pathology, and then we'll apply those rules to actual cases. And I'm not quite sure how many cases we'll be able to go through, but we'll go through each one of those together. So we have about 206 bones in our body without those bones. I wouldn't have been able to go to Orange Theory. If I haven't told you about Orange Theory, I'll tell you about it. Hopefully towards the end of the talk. Anyway, I wouldn't have been able to do any of those physical exercises if I hadn't all my bones intact. Now, my bones are obviously getting a lot older. Many of you have younger bones. You don't have osteoarthritis. That's something we're going to be talking about. The question is, what's in those 206 bones? And if you take the 10,000 mile high view, it cells, osteocytes, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, we'll talk about each one of them, a lot of proteins in there. And the most abundant, ubiquitous protein is type 1 collagen. And then unlike any other organ in the body, there are inorganic elements. And the inorganic element that is best represented or the most represented is calcium hydroxyapatite. And we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. I'm not going to be talking too much about the functional aspects of the skeletal system. Obviously, it has a structural function. You're standing, and that's because of bones. It has a huge role to play in calcium and phosphorus metabolism. It stores the hematopoietic element. It nourishes them. It holds them there. It, it provides the requisite elements to keep that trilineage hematopoiesis going. And perhaps many of us forget that there is a major endocrine organ as well. But that's enough about that. So let's start this talk by talking about long bones. And perhaps this is one of the longest bones in the body. You guessed it right. It's the femur. This is the femoral head, the greater trochanter, and the femoral condyles. And let's get this out of the way. No, this is not a normal piece of bone. This was actually a D-differentiated chondrosarcoma, and you can see it actually infiltrating through the cortex of the bone. But that's not the why I have this image up here. The reason I have this image up here is to tell you the three parts of the bone, because you'll hear a lot about this. The radiologist will tell you this is a metaphyseal lesion. So you got to know where the metaphysis is. The metaphysis is sort of this 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 the end but not the very end it's where this flare takes place right so this is the metaphysis distal to it that's the epiphysis so bone tumors there's some bone tumors that exclusively almost exclusively occur in the epiphysis chondroblastoma is an excellent example so that's the epiphysis and then everything between the two metaphyses from this end to this end is the diaphysis. So the very end is epiphysis, the middle is metaphysis, and the length of this is the diaphysis. So here's another image. Again, I'll remind you that this is not a normal piece of bone. This certainly is pathology. This actually turned out to be a very well differentiated osteosarcoma. But again, that's not the reason why I have this image up here. What I wanted to point out to you is within that bone, there are essentially three layers. There's the cortical bone, uh, referred to as compact bone, because it's thick and very dense. 
There's the cancellus bone that looks a little like honeycomb, right? So it has this very spongy appearance. That's where you tend to see a lot of marrow. And then there's the outer layer that covers the surface of the bone, and this is referred to as the periosteum. So the periosteum is somewhere there. So let's look at it histologically. That is the cortical bone. It looks very dense, so lots of bone, as opposed to cancellous bone that has very little bone. And then you'll see these holes in it, and these are the haversian canals, and we'll talk a little bit more about haversian canals. This sort of less dense bone is cancellous bone, so these are the trabeculae of cancellous bone, and that's where you'll find marrow, although the older you are, the less likely you are to find marrow in the bone. And the outer surface is the periosteum. We'll take another look at the periosteum. And what I forgot to mention on this image is the endosteal surface. Now the endosteum, which is here on the inner table, off the cortex is actually lying not as well developed as the periosteum but it has a layer of flattened osteoblasts here now you'll often hear the radiologist talk about endosteal endosteal scalloping in terms of a cartilaginous neoplasm when they refer to that term this is what they are referring to now whether it be cancellous or cortical bone all of that, all of the normal bone, essentially all of the normal bone, is arranged in what is referred to as the lamellar architecture. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean these parallel lamellae. Notice this dark pink and this light pink pattern. I'm also going to ask you to take a close look at the osteocytes themselves. Notice how they are oval in shape and they're arranged parallel with the lamellae. Now there's a number of ways you can highlight that lamellar architecture and that does become important as we'll see in a moment with some of the, our cases. But you could certainly do some special stains to highlight that lamellar architecture, but there's other things you can do as well. Polarized light, it works really nicely and I'll show you an image or two. But there is a poor man's alternative to this as well and that is just crank down your condenser and you'll see those lamellae a lot lot better so cranking down works really well and is extremely cheap so it turns out that the bone is actually not organized in these parallel lamellae instead it is actually organized in this concentric fashion the center of it wait for it is the Haversian Canal. So there's the Haversian Canal that has a vessel, that has a vein, an artery, and a nerve, and that's how the bone gets its blood supply. And arranged around that canal are these osteocytes and bone arranged in this concentric fashion centered around the structure. So the bone is actually composed, and this is referred to as the Haversian system, is composed of these Haversian canals, concentric rings of osteocytes and lamella bone, all fitted together. And these individual units are referred to as osteons. So it turns out, if you think of it, you are not made up of largely of neurons, you are actually made up more of osteons than you are of neurons. Now that's a novel way of looking at the human body, isn't it? So while looking at this image, I did want to make one more point. This is of course an osteon, but you'll notice that some of these spaces, referred to as lacuna spaces, do not have osteocyte nuclei in them. Now often, that is used as a criterion to identify devitalized or dead bone, but you'll see that the lacuna space is far larger than the osteocyte nucleus. And so you can imagine if you get a section down here, at the upper end of the lacuna space, you'll obviously not see a nucleus. So a loss of a few nuclei does not mean it is devitalized bone. And of course, the other thing that makes those nuclei go away is over decalcification. So don't generally make a diagnosis of devitalized bone solely on the basis of loss of osteocyte nuclei.
Now, for the most part, within the heart of the bone, you have these concentric osteons all the way here. But at the endosteal and periosteal surfaces, it's somewhat different. It is what is referred to as circumferential lamellae, and they essentially run parallel to one another. Now, all of this organization, whether it be concentric or whether it be circumferential, is all organized by type 1 collagen. That's the strong collagen. And it Bones are composed of a large amount of type 1 collagen, so a lot of the bone strength, we've got to be thankful for the presence of type 1 collagen. So here's a look under polarized light. Here's the concentric arrangement of the lamellae. And then at the periosteal surface, you see this parallel arrangement, and that is the circumferential arrangement. You could see this on an H knee as well. There's the concentric arrangement, but it's somewhat, it's so much easier to see this under polarized light. And here you go again, concentric and circumferential lamellae. So this is an electron microscopy image of an osteocyte. Now it is housed in the lacular unit. And the fun thing you'll notice is that the osteocyte is, is, is a smaller structure housed in a much bigger home, the lacuna space. The other thing I'll point out is that it has all of these lovely dendritic processes. So it turns out that the osteocytes essentially <laughs> seem to love one another because they send off these dendritic processes within the substance of the bone. So there are these tunnels referred to as canalically. Obviously, we can't see them. And these dendritic processes run through these tunnels and connect up with other osteons and with osteoblasts. So you may well ask yourself, why all these connections? It turns out that the bone is, is a living entity and can remodel itself. It can sense pressure, it can sense tension, and, and it can remodel itself. And that's briefly um, what Wolf's Law is all about. So it's a living structure. And one of the re ways it does that is through all of these wonderful connections. There's a couple of fascinating facts about osteocytes. Did you know that there were 42 billion osteocytes and 9.1 million osteocytes created every day? And in fact, if you count up all of these processes, they are 23 trillion processes. Can you imagine that? I, yes, I said trillion. So this is cancellous bone. Um, if you actually measure up, just talking about numbers, if you measure up, all of the inner surfaces of the trabecular bone, it actually will fill three football fields. And this is, of course, the American version of football. And finally, let's talk a little bit about the periosteum. The periosteum is, of course, on the surface of all bones. It's generally not very prominent in the normal state. You injure it or you sort of stimulate it with a tumor nearby, it becomes a lot more obvious. It's in two layers. There's the outer fibrous layer and the inner cambium layer. Within this inner cambium layer, you'll find all the progenitor cells and you injure the bone those cells will proliferate, differentiate into, into osteoblasts, start depositing bone in a very peculiar fashion that we'll talk about in a few minutes. The bone is connected to the underlying periosteum using the Sharpie's fibers. Sharpie indeed, that's what it, they're called. And the other thing that attaches to the bone, obviously, is ligaments, and that's how we so we are able to move. If you look at the tendal ligamentous insertion site under the microscope, you'll see this very peculiar fibrocartilaginous sort of area, right? So these look like lacunar spaces. These indeed do look like chondrocytes, and so that's that's what a tendal ligamentous insertion site looks like under the microscope. Obviously, the bone requires nutrition. It comes through the nutrient artery. This is a branch of the nutrient artery. It's a, generally accompanied by a vein, and there's probably some nerves traveling along with it for the for the right as well. The nutrient artery penetrates the cortex and then goes and distributed, distributes itself in the cancellous bone, goes all the way up the metaphysis, and then there are vascular channels that go 
up across that metaphyseal epiphyseal junction to supply the epiphysis. So let's talk before we move on, talk about cement lines or reversal lines. So the bone grows and wait for it by appositional growth, that is APPO, appositional growth. Essentially, it means that bone, the way bone grows, is depositing new bone on the old bone. So this is the analogy I want you to think of. Think of a really cold country. This is actually Boston. This was our first snowstorm of the year. Uh, me and my son went out for a walk, and this is a local park, and you can see a fair amount of snow. Typically, we got a foot or so. This was only about six inches. So think of what you do when you want to venture out into that really cold weather. So you wear multiple layers. So this is the initial bone, and then, you, and then there's a new set of osteoblasts that march in and then deposit a new layer. That's the mid layer. And then there's a new set of osteoblasts that follow that initial layer and deposit the outer layer. And then there's a the couple of osteoblasts that come in and accessorize your, your bone. So that's really what that's how bone grows, by oppositional growth. So think of this set as their first layer of osteoblasts coming in, and then this is the next set of osteoblasts, and this is the third set of osteoblasts, and this is probably the accessorizing of your uh, bone. And so between these various layers, you see these very dense basophilic lines. Now, we don't really know what comprises of these, ba what what makes up these basophilic lines, but it is either that they're rich in minerals or there's mucopolysaccharides deposited between the layer. But regardless, that is how these cement lines or reversal lines are, are, are generated. And when you see a lot of them, it essentially means, if you think about it, it means that there is a lot of bone turnover because given enough time, the bone will resorb much of those reversal lines and lay down that nice lamella bone that you see in a mature skeleton. Now, of course, I'm showing you reversal lines, not a normal bone. Does anyone know what we are looking at right here? This actually turns out to be a parosteal osteosarcoma. So what else is in bone? So one of the unique things about bone is that it has a huge amount of inorganic components and, and, and what it has is a vast amount of modified hydroxyapatite and of course I'm not a chemist so don't look to me for answers but apparently the hydroxy molecules are replaced by calcium and phosphate which is why the bone is known as a rich source of calcium and phosphate in the body. What I found fascinating is, and I don't don't quote me on this, uh, I am not endorsing this product by any means, but it turns out that you can actually buy this stuff on the internet, calcium hydroxyapatite. Again, don't look to me. I don't know whether it works or not, but you know, all I'm saying is that this this stuff is available out there. Um, we talked about the presence of type 1 collagen, and there's a number of other collagenous, non-collagenous proteins out there. Um, I'm not going to talk about them, except to highlight osteocalcin, because it's used as a marker of bone turnover. I remember at one point, it was attempted to be used as an immunohistochemical marker for osteoblasts and osteosarcoma. It didn't really work. It's now used as a clinical marker of bone turnover. So let's actually start, turn our attention to the cells themselves, right? Because that's what we are. We are pathologists. We look down the scope. We are learned to identify the cells. This is a row of osteoblasts. So how do you recognize osteoblasts? The best way I know is the cell what are these cells associated with? They are associated with osteoid and therefore these are osteoblasts. That's definitely one way. That's the way that works perhaps the best. And I couldn't say it better than Goethe who said, and you can read it there for you, if, you, if you're associated with bone, you're probably an osteoblast. But there are of course other reasons why uh, 
these are osteoblasts. Um, one feature is that they are look very plasma cytoid. In fact, they look very much like plasma cells. There's a perinuclear half or clearing. The chromatin is, of course, not clock faced. Instead, you tend to see these small nucleoli. But the one major difference that I find from plasma cells is look at the nuclei. They, they, to me, they almost seem to be exiting the cytoplasm. That is, there is no cytoplasm at this end of that eccentric cell. And then, of course, they are blasted against the bone, which is perhaps the most helpful feature. But also notice the other thing that the cytoplasm is polarized towards the bone and the nucleus is on the other side. It's a pretty consistent feature. Some of these osteoblasts die away once their job is done, but others transform into osteocytes, such as in here. So obviously osteoblasts do a lot of things. They have a large number of cell surface receptors. The only one I would highlight for you is rank ligand for the moment. After their osteoblasts have done with uh, their activity, they actually decrease in size, the cytoplasm tends to disappear, and they begin, become these very flattened cells on the surface of the bone. So they're now barely recognizable as osteoblasts. These are quiescent osteoblasts. So the best way to recognize the osteoblasts is where are they located? If they are plastered on the surface of the bone, they're probably osteoblasts. And the other version is the plasma cytoid cells. So let's talk now talk a little bit about osteoclasts. These are resp responsible for bone resorption. Here they are, these osteoclasts. They typically have four to 20 nuclei. Rarely they'll have more nuclei than that. Most of them will have about five or six nuclei. Again, often, but not always, they're up against the bone. And this is what they do, the osteoclasts. They come and sit on the surface of the bone, they seal the two ends, and then they do their magic of, re of, resol of resorbing the bone. I'm not going to get into those details, of course. But here's that osteoclast. Here's that little space that they've created by drilling into the bone, and that space is referred to as the Hauship lacunae. So the way these osteoclasts are activated is... There's a, it's a fairly complex signaling network, but let's just focus on the rank, rank ligand signaling network. So rank is expressed on the surface of osteoblasts in some stromal cells. The rank ligand is expressed on, the, on these osteoblasts. The rank receptor is actually expressed on the osteoclast precursor cells. Once this axis is engaged, these cells differentiate and do what they what they're supposed to do, that is drill and resorb bone. But obviously you don't want the bone to be just eaten away. That'll weaken our bones and result in fractures. So there is a mechanism to check that. And that check, and that check and balance is osteoprotegerin. This is OPG. When it gets in there, it blocks the signaling. It's a sort of a decoy here. It blocks the signaling of rank and rank ligand, and therefore you do not develop osteoclasts, and therefore no loss of bone. This is going to become relevant in one of our cases. So think of it this way. If you have a lot of rank and rank ligand signaling, you get a lot of osteoclastic activity. If you can get an OPG, the protein in there, there is very little osteoclastic activity. So all of this time, we've been talking about lamella bone, but, and we know this is lamella bone because of the presence of these parallel lamellae. But there is another kind of bone, and that is referred to as woven bone. Now, woven bone differs from lamella bone in one major thing, and that is the absence, the absence of those lamellae. So woven bone lacks that lamella architecture, but in addition, there are other differences as well. If you notice, there's way too many osteocytes in, in woven bone, far more than you see in lamella bone. And finally, you tend to see a fairly prominent osteoblastic and osteoclastic rimming. Here are the osteoblast, there's an osteoclast, clastic rimming in woven bone. So this is lamella bone because of the lamellae. 
and this is woven bone. So here's a cheat sheet comparing woven bone to lamella bone. You got to think of woven bone as bone that is deposit the initial deposit of bone by osteocytes, osteoblast, excuse me, is woven bone, and eventually this gets remodeled into lamella bone. So it's what appears first, and that is woven bone. So generally, when you see woven bone, you know there's something pathological about that bone. So what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit, I'll show you a few examples of deposition of woven bone, because woven bone in both reactive and neoplastic conditions is deposited somewhat differently. This image is very typically the way woven bone is deposited, particularly under the periosteum. So this is the underlying cortex. Here's the periosteum. And this is what happens when the periosteum is injured or lifted off. New bone gets deposited between the cortical bone and the overlying periosteum. And it does so in this very peculiar fashion. And it's very, very consistent. It is in the form of what I like to refer to as Roman arches, as, as seen here in the Colosseum, or Colosso, as the Italians call it. I hope I got that pronunciation correct. So you see these Roman arches, and this is very, very typical of reactive bone in general, but more specifically, what happens right when the periosteum is lifted off. And so here's another example. The periosteum is being lifted off from this end of things. So this is the acute angle. This is the underlying bone. And you see these lovely Roman arches that cannot and will not be neoplastic bone. That has to be reactive bone. And that is what creates the so-called Cartman's triangle. If you remember, this is a triangle that is formed between the periosteum and the underlying bone in cases of osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, essentially with any rapidly growing tumor. And so this is a gross specimen of an osteosarcoma that has grown through the bone into the cortex. There's osteosarcoma here. It's In that process, it's lifted the periosteum. And right in this region, you start seeing this woven bone and this will be osteosarcoma. And I'll show you a microscopic image of the Cartman's phenomenon shortly. So underlying bone, periosteum up here. Here's the osteosarcoma. Here's the neoplastic bone, if you allow me to use that word. And at the angle of Cartman, at the Cartman's uh, acute angle of the Cartman's triangle, you'll see this reactive bone, although not quite as pretty Roman arches as I showed you in the previous images. So a word about Ernest Codman, and I'm, and I'm doing that for a very specific reason, because he, in the last century, was a surgeon at the Mass General Hospital. And what was interesting is that he was actually fired in the 1920s or 1910s. Um, and he was essentially fired because the hospital refused to with, refused to accept his plan for evaluating surgeon competence. He then went on to form what was then called Hospital Standardization Program, which is now eventually morphed into JACO, which inspects all hospitals in the United States. He now actually has a lab and surgery named after him, the Cartman Center for Clinical Effectiveness. So this is how you do it, folks. You find something really important, JACO, you get yourself fired, and then you come back, and that's how you get a center named after you. We talk so much about quality, and it strikes me as ironic that the man who, f who formed the framework for quality in hospitals was actually fired by my institution. Things have, of course, changed. So you'll see these Roman arches also within cancellus bone. Here they are again, perhaps less well developed, just to point out to you that this is the existing, pre-existing lamella bone, and this is all of the woven bone. Again, bone generally grows by appositional growth, so bone grows on bone. You often see this appearance in compression factors, but you'll also see this in other conditions as well. And here's a nice example of what happens if you let this heal. 
eventually what happens is that this is the pre-existing bone. You can see a lot of these osteocytes nuclei have dropped out. Perhaps this bone is a little over decalcified. But then there is appositional growth on the surface of this cancellous bone. This is no longer bourbon bone now. This is lamella bone. So it's been remodeled, but you can see this was the initial pre-existing bone, and this is new bone that has been deposited on the surface, now lamella bone. So what I thought I'd do is show you what osteoid looks like or what bone looks like in neoplasms as well. There is only one malignant bone forming tumor, right? And that is osteosarcoma. And in general, the bone in osteosarcoma has this very lace-like filigree sort of network. And that network is, that sort of deposition of osteoid is very helpful. You will not see an osteosarcoma with those Roman arch deposition, pattern of deposition. To quote Gotha, tell me who you associate with and I will tell you who you are. And this bone is associating with malignant cells and therefore this is malignant bone. This is an osteosarcoma. These, this bone is associated with osteoblasts and therefore this is benign reactive osteoid. In fact, the presence of a prominent osteoblastic rimming is a very reassuring sign that you're dealing with reactive or benign bone. And that's one of the cardinal rules of bone pathology. Now, clearly you need to see what cells are associated with that bone, but the pattern is very helpful. Again, this is not a pattern of bone deposition that you would see in reactive bone. There are no Roman arches here. Instead, there is this lace-like network. So even though all of the cells have died out, this sort of histologic appearance is very suspicious for an osteosarcoma. And indeed, on this biopsy, in addition to the lace-like network, we did have obviously malignant cells, and therefore this defines it as an osteosarcoma. Malignant cells right adjacent to the lace-like osteoid. But an osteoid does come in other shapes and forms. I'm not going to be able to cover all of them for you, but it can look rather blob-like here. And then here's another osteosarcoma. You can clearly see some of this bone is mineralized, but other parts of the bone is either semi-mineralized or not mineralized at all. And I will tell you that it is somewhat challenging to decide if this is indeed bone or is this just simply collagen? And that's one of the challenges when making a diagnosis of an osteosarcoma. Now, most osteosarcomas are associated with bovin bone and not lamella bone. There is one exception to that rule, and that's a parosteal osteosarcoma. You'll recognize this picture. I showed it to you very early when we were talking about these reversal lines. Look at this parosteal osteosarcoma. Typically, Land, but atypical cells between these big, broad seams of bone. And look at the bone itself. It, a lot of this is lamella bone. It's not always lamella with a parosteal sarcoma, but it's often this. So just because you see lamella bone does not mean that it's not an osteosarcoma. And all I can say about this case is just hope and pray you never see one of these. This is a very sclerotic osteosarcoma and here it is it's actually forming lamella bone and this is sometimes what happens in osteosarcomas elsewhere in this neoplasm the neo neoplastic cells were obviously malignant but when they get trapped in this very dense ivory like osteoid they become small and osteocyte like and this is referred to as normalization of these sarcoma cells finally i want to show you this case right so Take a look at this. This is bone, you'll all agree with me. It's deposited in this rather lace-like network, but look at the individual cells. Don't they look like osteoblasts? They actually look like osteoblasts, perhaps a little more plump, and they're osteoclasts as well. So is this some sort of a reactive proliferation? It is not. One is, of course, it's a little too cellular and too atypical, but two, notice that lace-like pattern. That lace-like pattern should make you very concerned that this may be a malignant process. In fact, the differential diagnosis here was either an osteoblastoma or an osteoblastoma like osteosarcoma. And one of the things that helped us define this as an osteosarcoma 
an osteoblastoma like osteosarcoma is the lace like network of cells most osteoblastomas have more larger pieces of bone and not this lace like pattern of growth but this was definitively an osteoblastoma like osteosarcoma because it showed invasion of pre-existing bone so what do i mean by that now that's one of the cardinal rules in bone pathology if you can see a neoplasm invading pre-existing bone that is malignant so what is pre-existing bone pre-existing bone must be lamella so you've got to make sure that this is lamella bone, this is lamella bone, you can see tumor marching through this, and therefore this is malignant and not an osteoblastoma. So a fundamental rule in bone pathology, infiltration of pre-existing bone, i.e. lamella bone, is malignant. A couple of other examples, this as you will see is lamella bone, this is bone that is deposited not in a lace-like pattern but more of a blotchy pattern this is an uh, bone in an osteoid osteoma and finally this is bone in fibrous dysplasia these spicules they're supposed to look like Chinese characters although most Chinese will tell me that their characters look nothing like that this is also one lesion where you see this is in fact the only one of the only bony lesions in which you see these fibers connecting the fibrous stroma with the bone. These are Sharpie's fibers, and that's a hint that you're dealing with fibrous dysplasia. So fibrous dysplasia shows woven bone, typically without osteoblastic rimming. Well, there are occasionally Gotha will get this wrong. So this, you might say, is malignant cells. Here's bone. This is pre-existing lamella bone this is looks like woven bone you might argue that this is osteosarcoma this was actually an intraosseous synovial sarcoma genetically proven synovial sarcoma so occasionally go to lies merely the company you keep may not necessarily indicate that you're a bad person occasionally every one of us does keep poor, bad company and does not make us all bad does it so a few quick words about cartilage. The most common form of cartilage you'll obviously see is hyaline articular cartilage. This is at the articular end of bones. This It has this very thick, glassy, bluish matrix within which you have lacunar spaces with chondrocytes within those lacunar spaces. Remember, the cartilage is not directly vascularized, so vessels do not come from the subchondral bone plate. Instead, the cartilage is fed from the synovium itself. The other common cartilage you'll see is fibrocartilage. As you can see, it lacks that glossy hyaline character, but it has a very fibrous feel to it. It looks like collagen, doesn't it? But it, what marks it as cartilage is that there are lacunar spaces within which chondrocytes are located. The third form of cartilage is elastic cartilage, which we shall not discuss. So as I promised you, we're going to look at a series of cases. They have some interest when you evaluate non-neoplastic bone pathology, but they also give you a fair degree of grasp on what the bone looks like within non-neoplastic diseases. So let's look at this. This was from the, the knee joint. Um, and when you see, there's certainly cartilage focally in the knee joint here, but notice that the cartilage is completely lost here. This is classic severe osteoarthritis. We refer to this phenomenon where you see this knife-like defect in the bone and complete loss of bone, and I emphasize complete. That is referred to as ebonation. You'll also notice that right below it, the bone is somewhat thickened. Right here, here's another uh, focus of ebonation and you can see that the bone immediately under what should have been the articular cartilage is thickened but the under bone further be beyond that has a normal thickness this is referred to as e as subchondral bony sclerosis all of these of course are features of osteoarthritis this man or woman must have been suffering from significant pain from osteoarthritis this is a cyst you commonly see cysts beneath these the subchondral events and this right here is a classic 
feature of osteoarthritis and that is osteophyte formation. Now osteophyte formation is essentially, if you want to think of it this way, is new bone formation at the very edge. Interestingly enough, that new bone is typically covered by fibrocartilage. So this is severe osteoarthritis, no biggie. But look at the adjacent section from this very knee, right? So there's ebonation, subcondyl sclerosis, and notice all this cartilage and it appears to be percolating pre-existing bone and we talked a little bit about this and what I told you is any lesion that infiltrates pre-existing bone and by pre-existing I meant lamella bone and this is clearly lamella although this looks a little bone here any lesion that infiltrates pre-existing bone should be malignant and therefore this looks like hyaline art well this looks like hyaline cartilage doesn't it and therefore this is a chondrosarcoma. But it turns out that this is not a chondrosarcoma. This is what sometimes happens in cases with severe osteoarthritis. That cartilage is a reparative response. This is a chondrosarcoma. This is invasion of pre-existing bone, lamella bone, lamella bone. Many chondrosarcomas of the bone often show a mixoid character. It's some less common to see hyaline articular, hyaline cartilage in a chondrosarcoma. So this is not infiltration. This is just reparative hyaline cartilage appearing to mimic a chondrosarcoma. A couple of other features associated with osteoarthritis. Notice this fragmentation with deep clefts of the hyaline articular cartilage. This is not an artifact, this is real. The other feature that is quite characteristic, and this is very characteristic of degenerating articular cartilage, uh, is the phenomenon referred to as cloning. Now each lacuna space should have a single nucleus. Notice there's at least about 20 nuclei within that lacuna space. So cloning, all it indicates is it, it indicates a degenerative phenomenon. And here's that example of cloning again. So here's another example. I, I believe this was the humerus or the femoral head. Um, complete loss of cartilage, a knife-like defect, ebonation, thickening of bone immediately beneath subchondral sclerosis. The bone is typically fatty because de degenerative joint disease is a disease of older adults. There's a bit of marrow here. And here's a very classic osteophyte. So new bone formation at the very edge of the joint and typically covered by either hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is more typical. Often the osteophyte will have a fair amount of marrow while the main bone will lack marrow. Time for case two. So the case two is a lytic lesion in the neck and trochanter of an adult male. You can see a lytic lesion, but I want you to focus your attention to this line here, and it's going to become important in a minute. So here's the growth specimen, the head of the femur. Clearly there's a aggressive mixoid lesion corresponding to that lytic lesion. But again, watch what's going on here. There's something interesting happening just outside the greater trochanter. So this indeed turned out to be a chondrosarcoma with a mixoid phenotype. Again, notice pre-existing lamella bone with infiltration. That defines this as a chondrosarcoma and the cells were atypical as well. But I'm going to show you a section from right here. So here's that very low pop view of that section. This is within the bone. You can see this is infiltrative. This is the chondrosarcoma. But what's going on outside the bone here? Right? So there seems to be lines of cartilage, very linear appearing cartilage. Let's take a closer look. Here's that very linear looking cartilage. Now again, you're going to put your thinking hats on. Is this lamella bone or is this bobin bone? Bobin bone, right? No lamellae, very cellular. And it's merging right into this extremely cellular, and you might argue concerning cartilage, but I point out to you that these these cartilaginous cells, these chondrocytes, have very clear space around them. So small nuclei, small cells, 
in housed in a big lacuna space here it is again cartilage linear very cellular this is outside the bone the periosteum is somewhere here so it's just above the bone and again that cartilage looks very linear and is surrounded by reactive bone and i want to point out one other thing it's right here notice this blue cartilage is found in the midst of this reactive bone bone this is referred to as endochondral ossification and we'll talk about it more later in this talk so there's more endochondral ossification going on here as well so here it is that cartilage with that clear sort of pale space around the chondrocytes surrounded by reactive bone there's no doubt that the stuff in the bone this is in the bone this is chondrosarcoma but this stuff outside the bone is a fracture callus so this is a fracture callus so how do you miss how do you diagnose a fracture callus one is of course radiology is certainly helpful two a fracture callus will show very cellular cartilage often with those very clear lacuna spaces and i think the most helpful thing as far as i am concerned with the fracture callus is the linearity of the callus so our chondrosarcomas don't go in a linear fashion like this so a linear cellular piece of cartilage surrounded by all of this reactive bone is very concerning for a fracture callus as well as these large spaces filled with this large lacuna spaces with this rather clear occasionally this pale eosinophilic cytoplasm it looks a little between a hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage and it merges right into woven bone but at the end of the day perhaps the most helpful sign is that very linear arrangement of the cartilage so case 2 was indeed a chondrosarcoma with an added bonus a fracture cartilage and and if you remember the plain film there's that linear break that's the fracture so let's look at case 3 this was a young kid with a lesion in the soft tissue and interestingly enough at an outside institution it was called osteosarcoma because there was bone and there were cells that looked very very atypical but let's look at this low power appearance it's quite striking there's this myxoid material that I'll show you looks a little like nodular fasciitis. And then there's bone, perhaps more at the periphery. And then there's a central zone that looks extremely cellular with some pink looking stuff here. Let's look at it on the higher part. This is that nodular fasciitis like area. Let's put that aside for a second. This is what we saw out in the periphery of the bone. Now look at this. There is clearly woven bone and a prominent osteoblastic rimming. Remember the rule when you see benign appearing osteoblasts lining the bone, that is very unlikely to be an osteosarcoma. So there's a fundamental rule. If you had applied to this case, you would not be calling this an osteosarcoma. But the worrying part of this case was this stuff. It looks extremely cellular and looks very bothersome, doesn't it? it? This is something that could scare anyone, but take a closer look. Look at these sort of bars, these linear bars of eosinophilic material. This actually turns out to be very primitive osteoid. And if you look around, there are cells that are now looking like osteoblasts. These, here's, here's more of them. This is a very, this is a super very primitive osteoplastic or osteogenic progenitor cells and it's and as you go to the periphery of this lesion you start seeing maturation so now from very primitive looking stuff you're getting to see more woven bone that is easily recognizable as bone there are lots of osteocytes here and very benign looking osteoblast this is not an osteosarcoma again this is that primitive stuff that's maturing out so the word that i would emphasize here is maturation so don't let these areas scare you. These are just primitive looking osteoblasts that are beginning to form bone. And indeed, this is myositis ossificans. This is a pseudoneoplastic lesion. In fact, this patient did have a USB-6 fusion, which is very typical of 
myositis ossificans. And the important thing to remember is one is the maturation from the center to the periphery, and two, at, at where there is maturation, the bone is lined by benign appearing osteoblasts. So myositis ossificans mimicking an osteosarcoma. I wanted to show, share with you one additional case of myositis ossificans, and this was an interesting case. This was a young man that on a biopsy that had been performed about three months prior to this resection, the biopsy had been called an osteosarcoma. This is just plain and simple myositis ossificans. Of course, this is at a much more mature change. And really what happened in this case is that at the time of biopsy, it looked as primitive as the case I showed you. Three months later, it's all matured out. So even those primitive areas have become well-formed lamella bone, although you continue to notice that the center of the lesion is less mature. The periphery of the lesion is far more mature. So here's the periphery of the lesion and you see fairly decent lamella bone. I wouldn't consider this as completely mature, but the center of the lesion clearly looks a lot more immature with much more prominent osteoblastic rimming. So myositis ossificans that has matured out a great deal more than the case I first showed you. So let's look at case four. This is a specimen from the femoral head. And the first thing you'll notice is that the articular, island articular cartilage has actually broken off the underlying subchondral bone. Now you could argue there is, this is an artifact, but it seems as if there's a reaction around this, right? So there's this pink material all around it and perhaps there's a little bit of cartilage. This, ladies and gentlemen, is osteonecrosis, or some people call avascular necrosis. And the reason why this crack develops here, and this, by the way, is grossly and microscopically extremely classical to see a break right under the subchondral bone. The reason why this develops is remember that the articular cartilage is fed as far as nutrition and oxygen goes from the synovial fluid, while the subchondral bone comes from vessels, vessels that come up from the metaphyseal region. So all of that is dead. This is alive. This is the weakest link, the link between the articular surface, the articular cartilage and the underlying subchondral bone is weakened and hence that crack right there. So when you look at this on higher power, you can see that the cartilage is alive. This is just reactive cartilage not a single osteocyte is visible. So this is true necrosis of the bone. Often necrosis of the bone is, a, is, is accompanied by this pink fibrinous degenerated material in the, in the space. Now, we're going slightly lower in the femoral head. Now, the bone continues to be dead. There are no osteocytes. So this is necrotic bone indeed. You can see that the marrow is necrotic, so it's very unusual for the bone to die and the marrow to be alive. So if the bone is dead, the marrow generally accompanies it, and that's a hint that the loss of osteocyte nuclei is real. But this is the interface between the dead and the alive, and you can see that the body at the periphery of this wedge-shaped necrosis is trying to bring in fibroblasts, and that fibrosis is just that. So this is avascular necrosis, Again, you can see this necrotic debris, dead bone. This was a lamella bone at one point, but now it's all dead. This is osteonecrosis of the femoral head. This was likely driven in this particular case by the long-term steroid use. All right, so case five. This was a femoral head on an elderly male. Here's the articular cartilage. It looks somewhat fragmented, clearly no ebonation. The bone looks interesting. It's somewhat sclerotic, right? So there's these thick in trabeculae. The trabeculae in a humor, humoral head, particularly in an elderly male, should be about as thick as this. So there is some level of osteosclerosis, but I'll also point out that somebody has gone in and chewed up pieces of, pieces of bone. So here's a little defect, here's another one, there's another one, there's another one. So there's lots of these defects in what appears to be a slightly more sclerotic bone. The marrow looks just fine. And when you look at this under higher power, 
there seem to be one too many osteoclasts. And the reason I know they are osteoclasts is because they seem to be structures that look like Hauschip lacunae, that almost looks like dissecting osteitis, something you see in hyperparathyroidism. There's, some, there's an osteoclast type giant cells. So clearly, there's a lot of bone, most of it is lamella, but they seem to be, for whatever reason, osteoclasts busy drilling through this bone. Isn't that fascinating? Here's a higher par look. This, these osteoclasts have chewed through this bone. This does look, for the most part, like lamella bone. I'll bring your attention to this blue line. Remember what we call those reversal lines? They seem to be rather prominent. So there must have been a bunch of osteoblasts depositing this bone, another army of osteoblasts that deposited this bone. So this seems to be, bone seems to have been built in a rather haphazard fashion. It is lamella bone. And if you look at the osteoclasts themselves, I remember I told you that osteoclasts have about four to 10 nuclei. These osteoclasts seem a little too large with a little too many nuclei. Does anyone have a diagnosis? Oh, and then look at this piece. Look at the reversal lines, right? Anyone with a diagnosis? Well, this does is pretty classic. Sclerotic bone, areas of sclerosis, and then areas where the osteoclast type giant cells are active and tunneling through the bone. And they typically have these osteoclast type giant cells with a lot more nuclei than normal osteoclast type giant cells. So Paget's disease of bone. So I have one final case for you guys before I let you go and carry on with your normal lives. And this was a sacral tumor. And what you'll see right off the bat is that it seems to be, even at this very low power, the more cellular area here, and I'll show you more high power images from here, and a lot of bone from here. The bony areas looked somewhat like this. I, I'd never seen something like this before until I saw it. They seem to be trabeculae of bone, or could this be collagen, but it more looks like bone. And when you look at this under higher power, very bland looking cells, this looks a little like fibrous dysplasia, but it's not fibrous dysplasia. These certainly seem to be in lacuna spaces. If this is bone, this is certainly not a lamella bone. This is more likely to be woven bone. Oddly enough, there is no osteoblastic rimming. The biopsy from this sacral lesion looked like this. It looked like a classic giant cell tumor. So what happened? Why did this classic giant cell tumor of bone become that? Good question. All right, so let's continue looking. So this was all of that bony areas, but then there were these more cellular looking areas, and perhaps there are some osteoclast type giant cells here. Indeed, they are. They aren't very, this is, is not quite the image I showed you, right? But you can imagine that this would fit, in, uh, fit into a giant cell tumor of bone. So the question is, what transformed this tumor? Well, it turns out to be that this patient was on a drug known as denosinib. Now, remember, so we are going back to osteoclast function now. Remember, rank connected with rank ligand, and that connection was necessary for osteoclast function. It, denosinib is actually a rank ligand inhibitor. So it breaks this connection, so there's no signaling. The osteoclasts die away. In fact, when you treat a giant cell tumor with denosinib, the osteoclast type giant cells essentially one becomes smaller and two become far fewer and eventually there are no osteoclast type giant cells. And guess what happens when you lose your osteoclast type giant cells? You start getting bone because giant cell tumors do produce some bone, but the osteoclast type giant cells are so active that they take it out. You take away the osteoclast type giant cell functions. Remember, the osteoclast type giant cells are not neoplastic. They are along for the ride. You take them out, the bone comes back. And that is when you see enormous amounts of bone like this. So you treat a giant cell tumor with tenosinib, which is a rank ligand inhibitor.
you end up with a lot of bone. So it looks very, very different. So with that, I'll stop. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I'm, I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Here's a paper that we wrote many, many years ago about this entity. And I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank the organizers. I wanted to thank particularly Dr. Gujral for this invitation. I'm happy to take questions. And if you have um, direct questions and you're too shy to ask, uh, feel free to email me at that email address. Thank you very much and good night.